Rachel was the most beautiful girl in her graduating class. She was voted most likely to have men fall at her feet. She was bubbly, gregacious, gregarious. She was, wow, I've got rented lips already here, I'm sorry. And, and everybody loved Rachel. Her older sister, Leah, well, she had a nice personality. Uh, Leah was voted the most likely to go through life unnoticed. Um, this disparity caused all kinds of division between the two young ladies. And as usual, the new young quarterback type came into town and he immediately was drawn to Rachel. And in all fairness, Rachel did see him first, but Leah liked him a lot as well. Well, if you add to this situation a father who, whose only concern was to leverage his two daughters to get as much out of them as he possibly could, then you end up with the biblical story of a man whose name means deceiver. A Jacob, he lived up to his name. He was able to trick his older and yet stronger and, and still yet mentally weaker brother, Esau, out of his birthright. And he traded him his birthright for, and this is what the, the text literally says, a bowl of red stuff. And then, later on, he pulls off the greatest identity theft of all time convincing his own father that he indeed was his older brother Esau so that he could steal Esau's blessing. Now, how would you like to marry into this family? And Jacob did it twice. Jacob, the deceiver, was about to learn a lesson from a great teacher. A teacher who, hands down, was a much better deceiver than Jacob ever even could imagine. But the focus of the story is not Jacob, and it's not his father-in-law, Laban, this greater deceiver. The focus of the story in the text is the two sisters, Rachel and Leah. And even though there's all kinds of, of emotional and relational, social plots and subplots swirling around this family, those two are the center of all of it. And we're going to focus on them today. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 29. If you're going to use the Pew Bible in front of you, you want to look at page 20. If, by the way, you don't happen to own a Bible, that pew Bible, uh, please feel free to take it as our gift. We'd love to get the Word of God into your hands. So page 20, Genesis chapter 29. Jacob is so smitten with Rachel, he goes to her father after a short time and says, I want to marry your daughter, and he, and he offers to pay her whatever dowry dad asks. Verse 18, Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give it to you than to some other guy. Now that is a ringing endorsement, isn't it? So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because he loved, his, he loved Rachel. But Laban played a dirty trick on him. Now, during the wedding celebration, there's a lot of feasting, and there's a lot of partying, and there's a lot of drinking. And so, this next part, you might think to yourself, how in the world did that happen? But Jacob probably had a lot to drink. And, well, he's about to learn a lesson from his father-in-law, Jacob, I mean Laban, who instead of sending Rachel the one he had served seven years for, into him, to their marriage chamber, he sent his older daughter, Leah. And when Jacob realized what Laban had done, he was 
not happy. What is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Well, the old deceiver was giving his apprentice the most important lesson he would ever learn. Laban replied, It's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, and then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And so, competition that has been at the heart of the relationship between Rachel and Leah from their growing up years continued, and for the first time, Leah had the advantage. But it didn't last long. Verse 30 of the same chapter. Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. He made it clear that his choice was, was Rachel, not Leah. Now, how he did that, the text doesn't tell us, but you can imagine what it was like. You can imagine what it was like being in this divisive household day after day. Jacob continually sitting next to Rachel. Jacob continually letting Leah sit all by herself. Continually, when Rachel would make him something, he would take it. He would, he would, he would enjoy it. And when Leah, well, maybe not so much. You can, you can almost feel the pain in Leah's words as she struggles with this. But God did something in her life that he wasn't doing in Rachel's life. And if you read between the lines, you can see how this entire thing is impacting Leah. Leah says in verse 32, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Surely my husband will love me now. Many of us make the mistake of thinking that when a child comes into a relationship, love will naturally follow. And Leah, Leah found out very quickly that not a lot was going to change because Jacob had made it clear that he favored Rachel. Laban had even rewritten cultural mores to perform his own version of a shotgun wedding, marrying off his less than desirable older daughter to make sure that she was cared for and taken care of and he got something for her. And then he married off Rachel, who was the apple of Jacob's eye. Now, somehow, even though she was the second wife, Rachel was able to finagle it so that, so that Jacob spent most, if not all, of his time with her. And we get this just by reading between the lines here. Look at chapter 30 and verse 14. During wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she, sa but she said to her, Wasn't it enough that you took my husband away? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight and return for your son's mandrakes. Now, this is in the Bible. I mean, think about what's happening here. When Jacob came in from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him. You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. How messed up is this? I mean, you have two sisters competing over their communal husband. Jealousy morphs into envy when Rachel sees something that Leah has that she must have for her own. And she rents her husband out so that she can have it. She gorged herself on mandrakes while her sister and there's no evidence of change in Rachel, unfortunately. When Rachel saw, verse, verse 1 of chapter 30 says, When Rachel saw that she was not bearing any children, she became jealous of her sister. 
Finally, the word comes out. She became jealous of her sister, so she said to Jacob, Give me children or I'll die. What she's saying here is, if I can't have things the way I want them, when I want them, I would be better off dead. Give me children, lest I die. And when it became obvious that Jacob couldn't pull a baby out of thin air, Rachel took matters into her own hands. Because when both daughters were married to Jacob, they were given servants. Handmaids to care for them, take care of them. So Rachel thought, well, okay, I can't have children of my own, so I will give my handmaid Bilhah to Jacob. And she will bear children, and I will claim those children as my own. And when Bilhah conceived and bore her first child, this is what Rachel said. God has vindicated me, He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Now listen to what she's saying. She felt wronged by God. And she was finally getting what she deserved. God was making things right. You see, when we are jealous, it's not that that we don't want anyone else to have something it's that we think that they don't deserve it as much as we do and who's the one who gives things to us it's God and if God isn't giving me the good thing that I see someone else has then I am going to hold this thing against God and she gets worse the next child that Bilhah bears she named him Naphtali and She said this in verse 8 of chapter 30. I have had a great struggle with my sister and I have won. I've won. It doesn't matter that her sister had more and more sons. That she hadn't personally borne any children at this point. She declared herself the winner. That's the insidious nature of jealousy and envy. We're never satisfied with what we have Because we don't see what we have as a gift from God. We only see what God has given someone else. And Rachel, the physically more beautiful, favored one, was so consumed with a jealousy-induced discontentment that even as she breathed her last breath, giving birth to her second child in chapter 35 and verse 18, She wants to name him Ben-Oni, son of my pain, or son of my struggle. She wants to memorialize this struggle between she and her sister, even in her death. And in a study of too little, too late, Jacob finally steps up to the plate and says, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to let your son be the last nail in the coffin of your jealousy. And he instead named him Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. Now, interestingly enough, we've been focusing on Rachel for a little bit. I want to look at Leah some. We don't know when or where Leah died. But what we do know may speak more loudly because of the silence about the time and place of her death. As Jacob was about to die, he gave these instructions to his sons. This is chapter 49 of Genesis, verse 29. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave of the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre and Canaan which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. There, Abraham with his wife Sarah were buried. There, Isaac with his wife Rebekah were buried. And there, I buried Leah. Now, Rachel is already dead. There, I buried Leah. I wonder 
if Jacob's desire to be close to Leah is because he saw something in her that he could identify with. You see, there was a time in Jacob's life when he was really known as deceiver. He was the guy who would do anything he could to trick anyone that, that he had to to get what he wanted. But there was a moment, an evening, when Jacob wrestled with God. And God changed his name from deceiver to Israel. And he became the father of the people who were the apple of his eye. Leah, for most of her life, jumped headlong into the jealousy trap. Her sister would throw out the bait and she'd take it every time. And there were many times as you read through their story, she would throw out the bait like with the mandrakes. And Rachel would take it every time. But something happened in Leah that changed her. I don't know that as you look at the, at, the, at the text and as you read the stories that it changed her totally. Life change takes time and some things are harder than others. But we do have a couple instances that really kind of make us wonder what was happening in her heart. In chapter 29, verse 34, we read, At last my husband, this is Leah speaking, At last my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So she's in the jealousy trap. So she named him Levi. Levi comes from the Hebrew word which means to be attached. But she broke out of that pattern at least for a little time. Look at chapter 29 and verse 35, the very next verse. Leah conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, which means let him be praised. Jealousy grows in the soil of discontent. When we don't appreciate, we don't value, we're not content with what God has given us. The Apostle Paul tells us, we do not dare to classify ourselves or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Comparison is the doorway to jealousy and envy. But you can choose door number two. And on the other side of door number two, Paul will tell us in just a moment, is great gain. Listen to what he says in 1 Timothy 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many harm, foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money. And you can put in their stuff, another person that you can't have. <clears throat> Fill in the blank. The love of that thing, that possession, that prize is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Leah grasped a hold of this truth. I think when she named her son Judah, she was saying, you know what? I've done this chasing Jacob thing. I've fallen in the jealousy trap time and time again, and it's empty. It's lonely. And she realized that the true love affair that she should have is with God himself. See, that's what it means to be a disciple. See, here at, at First Baptist Church, we're saying that we want every single one of us to be a disciple of Jesus. That means we're a learner of Jesus. We're, we're living with him, we're living for him. We think everybody should be connected with God and with one another. We think everybody should grow more deeply in their love for God. And we should grow in our spiritual maturity and we should then, because of all that, engage our culture and society. 
But if our connection with God is not a good connection, if we're connecting in our minds with a God whose job it is to meet my needs and take care of me, and he says he will do that, but if our attitude is, God, you owe me, and why did you give to Thorn something you didn't give to me? And, and why did you give to Megan something you didn't give to me? The Apostle Peter struggled with this. One of the last times that Jesus was with his disciples having just a private meal on the seashore. Jesus was telling Peter, this is what your life is going to be like. And Peter's there listening and he's, I mean, I don't know what was going through his mind because it wasn't all daisies and happy thoughts. He was telling him what he was going to suffer and how it was going to be hard, but that I'd be with him. And as he's alone in his own thoughts, maybe John cleared his throat. I, I don't know. But John was sitting next to him. And he said, well, what about him? That's the spirit of jealousy pushing its way in. When you look at someone else who has something you don't have, that's the opportunity the enemy wants you to grab onto to fall into the jealousy trap. And Jesus' answer to Peter is the same answer he would give to you and me. The song, first song we sang, you are loved by a good, good father. And he gives you everything you need. Don't worry about what I give someone else. You just be grateful for what I've given you. Our first and foremost love affair needs to be God himself. Jacob never got over Rachel. He was 147 years old, 147 years old, the, long, the oldest living man, just died last week. He was a Holocaust survivor, and he lived 113 years. Jacob was 34 years older than him. 147 years old, and he had still not forgotten Rachel. He called his sons together to give them his blessing, give them the last instructions, and here's what he said. This is chapter 48 and verse 7. As I was returning from Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. He loved her to the end of his life. But what good did it do her? She could not fully enjoy his love. Her ever-present insatiable discontent kept her from enjoying anything totally, and it kept others from enjoying her as well. They were just objects, vending machines to give her what she deserved. It isolated her in a grim, jealously, jealousy-induced loneliness. And then she died, leaving Jacob to the sister she envied so much in life. And even in death, she was alone. I don't want to make too much of this, but the passage says he buried her on the side of the road. I don't know. Maybe there wasn't the distance, the, 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 the intimacy and the closeness that Jacob really wanted. Jealousy, envy will do that to you. Are there things that God is kind of pointing at in, in your life that are keeping you from the intimacy that you long for with other people because they have stuff you don't feel good about because you want it for yourself. Jealousy does not provide us with anything. It robs us of what we already have because we cannot enjoy the gifts God has given us because we don't see them as gifts. We see them, we see God as withholding from us the best of gifts. 
but God, I'm not married yet. But God, I don't have a great job. I, I squeak by every month making ends meet barely. Sometimes the ends are frayed. But God, I, I don't have the internships. But God, I don't have the, the big six-figure job to go to when I graduate. But God, I, physically, I'm, I'm in pain all the time. I have to say, I, I, I stood in, in worship today singing about God being a my good, good father. And I have to say that I was so powerfully impacted by my friend Lois as I stand behind her. And she just told me she was wearing this neck brace because she's got four herniated discs and the doctor said they won't do any surgery. But she stood in worship, in pain. And she could have sat and she could have said, you know what? There are other people my age who don't have this kind of pain. What kind of God are you? Why would you do that to me? That's the wrong question. The right question is, God, help me to appreciate the gifts you have given me in the midst of my pain. God, well, well here's the thing. Do we believe that God is good? Do we believe that God is good to me? even when things don't go the way we think they should. Instead of complaining about her unresponsive husband, her jealousy, jealousy-driven jealousy sister, Leah said, this time I will praise the Lord. And don't miss this. Don't miss this. God gave Leah the honor of being the mother of the two most important tribes in the people of Israel the tribe of Levi, the priestly line, and the tribe of Judah, the line through which the Messiah would come. Now, I have to be honest with you. As I have reflected on this story over the years, I've always thought about how Rachel was the, was the hero. There's no heroes in this story but God. There's just real people like us. You trace the story about Leah, she got it for a, a, a moment. I'm not sure how long it, it, it stayed. I think it probably stayed long enough that Jacob noticed something different in her and wanted to be near her even in death. Jealousy and envy out our true faith. A faith in a God who serves us giving us what we want, giving us what we think we deserve, what we know will make us happy. Could it be that the emptiness, the loneliness, the conflicts in our relationships are the result of an underlying spirit of discontent fueled by jealousy and envy? I want to challenge you in your own mind to fill in the blank. Three statements. They won't be on the screen. This is just for you to think about. First thing that comes to your mind may reveal if you are in the jealousy trap. Here's the first statement. I will finally be happy if only. I will finally be happy if only. Next statement. It will be enough when. It will be enough. I will have enough. I can be content when. And here's the one that I have struggled with. I'll know God loves me when He. I'll know God loves me when he. We will never be content if we think satisfaction 
can be found in any material possession. Our improved circumstances or physical relationship. If that's where we're looking, then Mick Jagger is right. We can't get no satisfaction. Real satisfaction will only be found by making a profound and real connection with God. And whatever is happening in your life, driving that connection deeply to love Him with everything you have. Psalm 107, 9 says, He satisfies the thirsty and He fills the hungry with good things. And then Paul in Philippians shows us the secret to contentment when he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, listen for a second. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything. That's what we focus on, isn't it? I can do everything. I can do everything. And we miss the point. It is not I who can do anything. It's him who gives me strength. Faith is a muscle. The more we exercise it, the more we trust him, the more we believe him, Jesus says, if you have the size of faith that's as small as the grain of a mustard seed, then you can say to this mountain, be removed and it will leave. It is not about me being able to do anything. It is about the object of my faith performing everything. He is a good, good father. But can we say that in the midst of our pain? Will we say that in the midst of loss? Will we say that when the resources we desperately need don't come through? Will we say that when the person we wanted to invest our lives with turns away from us? Is he a good, good father then? See, he's not a conditional God. It's we who have the conditional faith. Contentment is not found in people. It's not found in pleasures. It's not found in possessions. The cure for jealousy is God himself. Even though the circumstances of life change daily, He never changes. He is the one constant in our ever-changing, always tumultuous life. The author of Hebrews says this, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And I'll add to this. What can man take from me or withhold from me that my good father won't give to me if he wants me to have it? How do you apply this to your life? I want to challenge you. Think about those three questions. Maybe a different question comes to mind for you. What is it that you're looking to to bring contentment in your life? Who is it that you're looking to to fulfill you? What accomplishment do you think is going to do it for you? I would encourage you to turn away from that and turn to your Father and let Him be the sole substance and focus of the love affair of your life. Escape the jealousy trap by finding your contentment in God alone. Find your contentment in God alone. I put together, this is not the kind of sermon where you're gonna, I'm gonna be able to give you just a 
you know, a, a quick application and you can just apply it immediately. This is something that goes deep down to, to the fiber of how we're made up. Last week I challenged everyone to think about being part of one of our life groups as they begin in September. Um, and that'd be an opportunity for us to develop relationships with other people, dig into the Word of God together, support one another, be family to each other. Um, and I also challenged us to think about being in a relationship with one or two other people where you can really kind of dig into your own discipleship, what it means to be a follower of Christ. With that in mind, I put together just a study guide. If anybody wants one of these, they'll be up on the front pew on this side. And it'll just walk you through what we talked about today, but it'll give you opportunity to really dig in. If God is beginning to uncover some things in your life, I want to challenge you. Don't let it sit. Think before you leave today, who is somebody that I could talk this over with? Who is someone I could open myself up to? I know that's a risk. And come grab one of these. If we run out, come see me. I'll give you a copy. Let's pray together. Father, I'm so grateful that we don't have to um, spend our lives caught in this jealousy trap. We can walk out of it. We can jump out of it. We can run from it. And I pray that we would do just that. I pray that we would escape the jealousy trap by realizing and by welcoming you as the one who gives us contentment, as our love affair. In Jesus' name, amen.